If you just happen to be joining us, we want to welcome you to Reclaiming Our Future, the black radical tradition in our time. This is the second panel of this morning. It is going to be on neoliberalism, spatial domination, and gentrification, the struggle to resist the new urban strategy. Our panelists include Ricky Sanders, James Dupree, Megan Malachi, and our moderator will be Patrice Armstead. And I just want to say something about Patrice very quickly. She's a native of West Philadelphia. She's a... She is a mother, a community organizer, and an MSW candidate in the social work, School of Social Work here at Temple University. Give her a hand for that. And let's keep it real about Patrice. We all know that her organizing is grounded in the ideology of the black radical tradition. Her research interest is public housing and its relationship to gentrification and neoliberalism. So without further ado, let's welcome Patrice Armstead to the stage. Thank you so much, Brandon. I just want to say really quick, because I think it's important to let folks know like how you're feeling. Um, coming here today, just organizing this with my comrades, four months for a four-day conference. I was feeling like really weary this morning coming in and really tired. I had to pull over to the side because it just came down on me um, real quick. And I think sometimes we get in that moment where you know, it comes down, like it really comes down on you. And my body was like aching and I was feeling sad. And I didn't know what it was. I just think I was just physically and mentally drained. And you know, we all got rid of our CDs, right? Because we listen to music on our phones and what so have you. But I know, I remember I had a CD in my car on the side of Frankie Beverly. And I put that on and I listened to We Are One. And I'm telling you, I had that on repeat from the zoo all we to here, right? I just kept, I just had it on repeat. And I'm telling you, it energized me. The power just came over me. And I remember Cornell said yesterday that the, our musicians and our artists are the vanguard of the movement. You ain't never lied. You ain't never lied. So I just wanted to say that, that's a quick testimony because that's how I was feeling this morning, but I feel so energized, there's so much power in this room, and I thank you all for being here and supporting this conference. So again, peace and greetings. I just wanna say really quick, um, I wanna thank my comrades from Brock the Black Radical Organizing Collective for understanding the urgency of having a panel on gentrification and the new urbanism. But I'm understanding the urgency in, in that panel because we can't talk about the black radical tradition without really tying and connecting the dots together. So I appreciate that. I'm gonna go quickly into the introductions. Mr. James Dupre, a prominent artist an educator based in Philadelphia. Since 2012, he and many others have been part of the Save Dupre movement to resist the city's unjust eminent domain seizure under the guise of redevelopment of his studios in Mantua. Dr. Ricky Sanders, to my left, is a professor of geography and urban studies at Temple University. Her interests are images of the city, critical pedagogy, and race, class, and gender. She has published in numerous journals, Revista, Artemis 11, professional geographer, journal of research, and didact didactics in geography, and has had two exhibitions of her photos at Temple University. She was recently honored by the Association of American Geographers with its award for enhancing diversity in the field. Prior to that, she was awarded the Outstanding Teaching Award. She was also named a fellow in the Center for the Humanities at Temple in 2009 and served as director of the Greater Philadelphia Women's Studies Consortium. She is currently working on securing funding for a collaborative project mapping perceptions of violence, safety, and the lives of African American women in Norristown, PA. I also had a pleasure of being in class this past fall with uh, Professor Sanders. 
race, class, gender, and the cities. That class was on point. I appreciate that. <laughs> Megan Malachi. Megan Malachi is a Philadelphia-based educator and activist. She is an organizer with Action Against Black Genocide and the Philly Coalition for Real Justice. <laughs> That's right, give it up for your comrade. <laughs> and Miss Belly, I believe she's making her way in. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce her. She's coming right now. Is that? No, that's not Miss Bell. Is that? <laughs> that's her, okay. Nellie Belly, Black Agenda Radio host. Co-founder and director of the Harlem Tenants Council and human rights activist who has worked, that's not Nell. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I guess I got, what, what is it? It's not punked anymore. You fire, Wanda, you fire, for real. All right. I'm gonna provide an opening statement just to lay the foundation for, for, for this panel. Um, new urbanism is a major force in poor communities across the country. This force has many dynamics and it's not just played out in the United States, it is a global issue impacting cities across the globe, such as London, Paris, cities in South America and Hong Kong. But what does this mean for Harlem, Baltimore, Ferguson, Philadelphia and Chicago? Through intentional disinvestment, black communities have suffered tremendously. Advocacy from the financial sector in the 70s to implement neoliberal policies was the infancy stage in the destruction of urban communities. Gentrification and eminent domain are state-sanctioned policies utilized to massively displace families. Some argue that gentrification is a class struggle. I agree, but the overarching issue is race. Capital is the driving force behind urbanization, it controls the entire process. The capitalist economic system operates within the white supremacist social system. They are mutually supportive, but the economic system could not change without fundamentally changing the white supremacist social system. This system functions to produce and reproduce white supremacy. Capitalists who function within a white supremacist social system produces and reproduces urban life. I am not arguing that white people are not impacted by the new urbanism and gentrification. I am arguing that race is the primary factor when implementing neoliberal policies which produce a neoliberal city for the white elite, resulting in massive amount of black people being spatially deconcentrated from their communities. Spatial domination or spatial injustice creates a precarious living condition and almost hostile environment for a person of color. As the elite begin to move in and occupy spaces, there is a rise in police occupation. Under these harsh and brutal conditions, we still have to strive for an anti-capitalist society. Until we are free of capitalism, we have, to, we have no other choice but to resist. We can't allow financial institutions, speculators, and institutions of higher education to dictate the future of our communities, of urban communities. We can't allow stadiums to be built in urban spaces instead of affordable housing. We can't allow the closing of public schools to be transformed into condos and lost for the elite while public education across the country is being underfunded and threatened with privatization. What does this mean for the black worker? Today's black worker isn't the same as the boys talked about in the black reconstruction in America. Critical geographer David Harvey talks about today's proletariat is no longer working in factories, but we see them in McDonald's, and in Walmart, two of the largest private employers in the United States. We see them cleaning our schools and cafeterias. They are adjuncts in our universities. Uh, Marx and Engels discuss how the worker was being pushed further from the center and into the countryside. But where's the worker being moved today? 
Are they being moved down south where the cost of living is cheaper? Are they living in crowded conditions? Are they couch surfing? I know y'all familiar with couch surfing, right? All right. Um, but one thing we do know under new urbanism, the right to the city is threatened. Our panelists this afternoon will provide a presentation on how they see gentrification and new urbanism in the space that they occupy, meaning in the work that they do. They will critique neoliberalism's gentrification and the new, the new urban strategy through the lens of an academic, educator, organizer, activist, and an artist. In conclusion, they will provide suggestions and solutions toward moving toward a new urban society that will benefit humanity. Some questions that I want you guys to think about during these presentations. What can we do to resist the new urban strategy, or should we resist the new urban strategy? Is it possible to have development without displacement? Is it possible to have cities for people, not for profit? How do we go from critical urban theory to radical urban practice? What are some alternative modes of urban living? What is the future of humanity under new urbaniz urbanization? Henry Lefebvre and Peter Marcuse and David Hari are proponents of the right to the city. This is a movement in different cities across the country. Through resistance of the new urban strategy, we can make the right to the city a global alliance. Thank you. And we'll have first Mr. Dupre. Uh, good morning, everybody. James Dupre, local artist, West Philadelphia. Not born, but raised. I moved to Philadelphia in 1955, 37, 35, Lancaster Avenue, Wright's Barbershop, where Malcolm stayed. Didn't know that at the time. <clears throat> Graduated the University of Pennsylvania, came back to the community and started a school, Voyage House with my wife. I had an after school program, Prince and Progress, serviced the Mantua community and the Powhatan Village community here in Philadelphia. I purchased property down in South Philadelphia when it was the art community and, and the highway was gonna be moved through, which is now Queen Village. In 1979, I had to go to 10 banks to secure a mortgage, which, <clears throat> I was forced to put 33% down, while everybody else was putting down 2 to 5%. When I talked about red line in the 70s, I nigga, you just crazy. <laughs> we all know what that's about right now. I've been fortunate enough to buy several properties and rehab them myself with my own funds and my own ways and move back to West Philadelphia. The crack cocaine got so bad in South Philadelphia, and after the fifth time they broke in, it was time to go to war. I got tired of them taking my lunch money. It was them or me. People in the community said, James, you have a family, you're an educator, college professor. We can't let this happen to you, brother. So I moved <laughs> to Mantua. I found a building that's 8,600 feet a city block on Haverford Avenue, when you walk out my door, you look down the end of the block, you see the Philadelphia Museum of Art that houses five of my pieces. I'm in 25, 30 museums around the country, around the world. I'm back. <laughs> I'm loving this building. People say, why do you buy this building, James? It's condemnable. I said, did you see this building? This is a city block space. It had oak beams in there in 16, 18, 20 foot intervals, 10 sections. That means you don't need a, su a supported, a weight bearing wall. I could build walls in there and I could have my classes, I could bring students in there and I could start my own school again. Yes. Two years in, the roof was, my wife said, go ahead, go ahead, do this. I sold the building for three, $300,000 I purchased for thirty. They said I'd never sell that building. Took it up to Mantua and went about designing and building that space myself. The roof was $68,000. I said, damn, I bought two properties for that. Put the roof on, electric work, plumbers in, I'm broke. The day I signed the contract with, with, with the roofer for the 68 g friend of mine from City Hall comes down and says, James, you better come down here and see these plans. 
say, what plans? They're getting ready to build a supermarket and you're at ground zero. No way. A week after that, I had a stroke, lost sight, sound, speech, and mobility on my right side. What am I going to do now? Long story short, my kids came and started SaveDupreStudios.org and researched. One of my sons is a city planner. The other one is an engineer. My third, my, my youngest daughter studied criminal justice, and they went about fighting back for me. Right? Right? First thing my kids find out, which I kind of knew because I went to the University of Pennsylvania, Kevin Bacon's father created the plan for urban development for the University of Pennsylvania and Drexel University, for Penn to move west and Drexel to move north in 1950. 35 years ago, they blighted the Mantua community, lower property values. I move in, now they want to take my property. What people didn't know is I had cut a deal with the city of Philadelphia seven years ago, and the council person berated me in her office like I was a two-year-old kid. I said, you don't want to do this to me. University of Pennsylvania, master's degree number 17. Why would you do that to me? I got five pieces in the Philadelphia Art Museum. I wrote and helped write the guidelines to artisan education for the state of Pennsylvania. Why would you do that to me? You don't want to do this to me. When we finished, it was 144,000 hits. What people don't know in the city of Philadelphia, on December 12th, four days, December 12th, 2012, four days before the law of intimate domain changed in the city of Philadelphia, the state of Pennsylvania, the city of Philadelphia sees 1,500 properties using the law of intimate domain. You get this letter that says, we have seized and condemned your property. What the hell is this? How do you seize my free and clear deed? How does that work? How do you seize my deed? Through the law of intimate domain. Well, that's a new Jim Crow law. That's what I said. I said, these are words of terror, condemnation. How do you condemn a brother like me? How does this happen? So we got a lawyer, then we got a second lawyer. But they freaked out here in the city of Philadelphia when I started saying things like, you seized the property of your own constituents knowing that this law was going to change. And I would say, <laughs> a council person said, <laughs> I said, damn, she's hissing at me like a snake. <laughs> Who the hell do you think you are? I said, I'm the man I always wanted to be. Now, who are you? <laughs> are you angry at me because I'm speaking in complete sentences? Oh, I get it. You never met a brother like me in your district. No. How dare you? So I proceeded. After my stress, my stroke, my isolation, by thinking I'm working in a vacuum to make the art. The first piece was the Wicked Witch, Wicked Witch of the West. Then I put her in effigy on the front door of my building. <laughs> then I put a bullseye on my building as I was being targeted by my own people who have forgotten their culture. Get emotional about this. I had thought I lost the anger until I came into this room. <laughs> Y'all bringing it back out because we do matter. Artists have come into these communities and have gentrified these communities where we no longer can live. I'm the last Mohegan on my block at Six and Bainbridge. Those of you that those of you that live in Philadelphia knew what I'm talking about. People come and have moved into our community and look at me like, how did you get here? I built this. This was the art community. There were 17 artists on my block. The city went forward, and I'll end. I know my time's running out. With appropriating, originally, my son-in-law said, Dad, they want an A-block radius to build a supermarket. That'll be the largest supermarket in the United States. 
they still went about seizing 55 properties in a four block radius. And we had city officials in their cohorts that purchased 20 of the 55 lots for 1,000, 5,000, and sold and was resold back to them for 40 to 60,000 dollars. They put it to the community against me saying that a supermarket was coming. We found out the supermarket had dropped out eight years ago. Them brothers was coming over there to lynch me. Brother came to the door, called me all kind of MFs and everything else. I said, but brother, I don't know you. Brother, why do you want to say those things to me like that? Let me open this door and let you see what's in here. This is my... 34 years of my 35 year dream. This is my dream. And the only way they're going to get it from me, and this is where my wife gets mad, is if I die, because this is it for me. I now call myself James Dupre Studio Museum in Mantua. What I plan on doing is to keep this struggle going because they appropriated the 55 lots using federally funded dollars where they were supposed to identify the what, the where, the why, the how, one year prior to declaration of taking. Can you imagine me coming to your house saying, I'm taking your shit and there's nothing you can do about it because it's the law. And I said, that's the new Jim Crow law. And when I found out I had no recourse for the struggle that they, the, what they, if you saw me a year ago, you wouldn't recognize me today. I said, that lynching out there in front was a symbol. It's the worst symbol in America. White folks hate it, and you know we hate it. And I put that up in my community and said, that's a self-portrait of me. The picnic by the RDA. And I was able to educate everybody in the community. They called out a congressperson, have him take that down. We had 15,000 hits that day. Right? I said, but did you read it? I said, it's a self-portrait of me. Do you go to a picnic or to a barbecue? Ain't nobody in my home went to no picnic. I said, sister, go back out there. And as they were yelling and cursing me, I would get closer and closer. And I said, sister, sister, do you go to a barbecue or a picnic? I'm going to open this door. I, you don't have to go in. And the brother that was cursing me said, you don't have to go in. But just look in this door and see what I've built here. There is nothing like it in this country for a brother that have now 10,000 working and living spaces in that, that building. Over three to 5,000 pieces of artwork. A lot of it based in political art, work that I will never sell. But I did 400 pieces of artwork in that three year span. Two books, the movie, documentary movie, the musical, and the artwork. They will destroy what took you a lifetime to build overnight. <laughs> build it anyway. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Dupre. Next, I want to call Megan. Malachi, to the microphone. Who streets? Who streets? Who city? Who city? Peace, everyone. Peace. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm really Happy to be here speaking as a native. Um, I'm not a gentrifier. I live 
in the same neighborhood that I grew up, and I plan to live there for the rest of my life. Um, the Malachi's, my family, have been in the city, in this space since the 1700s, so Philadelphia means everything to me. So I know the panel today is specifically about gentrification, but my personal interest is the intersection between gentrification and policing. As an activist in the coalition and also with AABG, that is what we are interested in and that is what we are in the streets fighting for almost every day. Um, so we all know that pretty much every major city in this country is experiencing staggering rates of gentrification. You're talking about Philly, New York, St. Louis, Chicago, all of the major cities that at one time were black cities are now becoming whiter and whiter by the minute, by the hour. But the one thing I think as activists and also as academics that we're struggling to really talk about is the fact that gentrification could not exist. Gentrification could not maintain itself without white supremacist's main tool of enforcement, and that is policing. We are currently, and correct me if I'm wrong, in the 22nd district which is around Temple, what they're calling North Central Philadelphia and, and what they're trying to call Temple Town. The 22nd District is one of the most violent, one of the most grimy police districts that we have in this city. And they are charged with protecting gentrification in North Philadelphia. They are charged with holding up arbitrary boundaries for gentrification and frankly controlling the movement of black people everywhere they are in this area. And so as I look out in the crowd, I feel like I'm for the most part giving information that we already know, but I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> um, so some of the major features that I've seen in Philadelphia and other places in terms of gentrification has been this need for more and more police, has been this need for more and more aggressive policing, and has also been the need for the police to act as enforcers for these arbitrary boundaries that gentrification has created. And when black people decide to fight back or buck or protest these arbitrary boundaries that gentrification has created, we are terrorized and brutalized by cops, security guards, people like George Zimmerman who think that they have the right to shoot black kids because they're wearing a hoodie and not where they're, they think they're supposed to be. And when the terrorization doesn't work, they ultimately execute us. So we have all know about Mike Brown, but what I find interesting is that we all don't realize that the underlying lying issues around what happened to Mike Brown is gentrification. St. Louis was a very black city for years, but of course when white people want to come back, what happens to black people? They're pushed out. And one of the places that black people were pushed out was to Ferguson. And so the climate that created, the climate that created the ability for Mike Brown to be shot down in the street wasn't just the issue of police brutality alone, it was also gentrification. It was also money. When we talk about Philadelphia, we can spend all day talking about the forces that are gentrifying our city. We have the University of Pennsylvania, we have Drexel, we have PHA, we have something called Labak Finn. <laughs> And we also have exactly where we are right now, Temple University. I went to school in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I came home one summer and got off the subway at Broad and Cecil B. Moore, and I looked around and didn't know where I was. And this is something that has happened in this particular area of North Philadelphia rapidly. You pretty much turned around for one moment, and before you knew it, there was a Quadoba and a Barnes and Nobles and a movie theater, like whoever thought there would be a movie theater in North Philly, right in the middle of Temple. 
And this kind of things are, you know, unfortunately what some of our people celebrate as a sign of progress, but obviously is not progress at all, is gentrification and they're making it so they can pretty much move all of us out. And we see how police support gentrification. Um, I see some comrades who have been very active in the move against the new stadium that Temple wants to build. It wasn't the president of Temple University standing in front of the door telling those activists that they could not come in. It was the police. And we see that in every major city. So when we talk about neoliberalism, in my mind, there's no greater example of neoliberalism than the police system. But when we talk about the neoliberals that we have in city government, that we have in state government, that we have in federal government, we have to think about what some of their reactions have been to gentrification. So the, one of the most, I think, common reactions that you see is silence. They say nothing. And then after that, you get the reformist, the people who talk about charity, feeding those people after you have gentrified their neighborhood, handing out soup and bread rather than justice. And then when it comes to policing, you have these same reformists talking about body cameras and community oversight as if they won't beat you with the camera on. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have what I like to call complicity and this vocal support. We have some people that are just so far into neoliberalism that they can't see the immorality of it. They're the people who move into these gentrified spaces and they're actively calling the police on community members, people who have lived there for 40, 50 years. Then you have people actively pushing for an increased police presence, which creates this climate where police are once again shooting down black people and other people of color. And then finally, you have the very crude argument that gentrification is simply a result of market forces rather than the truth that gentrification is nothing but greed, it's nothing but violence, it is the highest form of imperialism. So as an activist and a teacher, we have to start thinking about solutions and resistance. And so some of the main resistance that we've had in Philadelphia, of course, has been protests and rallies. We've shut spaces down We've claimed spaces for the people. But again, activists, we continue to face increasing police repression. And in Philadelphia, there's not enough people, at least right now in this moment, willing to put their bodies on the line to stand up for these neighborhoods. I wish I could see all the people in this building right now on the street shutting shit down. Then we also have brothers and sisters who are very involved in survival programs. We have um, a group from the North Philly Peace Park who are doing a lot of good work with the community. And what happened to the Peace Park? PHA comes and shuts it down. But where are the comrades, where are the revolutionaries who can stand up and tell the cops and tell PHA you're not shutting it down? There weren't enough of us. So, some of y'all gonna be mad, but here it is. <laughs> what is the solution to gentrification? The solution is stop being a gentrifier. Yeah. If you are living in a gentrified space and you're calling yourself a white ally, you're calling yourself a comrade of color, even if you're black, you can still be a gentrifier. I grew up uptown, and I can't tell you how many people I know who went to school with me, all of a sudden, they live on Baltimore Avenue. I'm like, why are you there? You know that's gentrified space, so why are you, are you continuing to move there, pushing this gentrification, this violence on the people who have been living in that space for generations? The next thing that we need to do is become serious about disempowering, disarming, and disbanding these cops. Because, yeah. 
Because again, gentrification could not maintain itself. Gentrification could not function in the violent manner that it does without the police working as enforcers. But frankly, that takes heart. It takes commitment, it takes discipline, and I'm not sure how many of us have that. And I hate to sound so pessimistic, but this is the reality. And something else we could do is know our rights. Know what we can and can't do on the street. Know what we can and can't do when it comes to keeping ourselves from being evicted from the places that we have been living for, gen for generations. And I think that is one of the major duty of radicals, right? It's to educate the community. It's to stand up physically, not just talking, when people are coming into our spaces and destroying the Philadelphia that I grew up in, destroying a neighborhood that I will never be able to afford to live in, And we also have to build solidarity. And I'm not talking about solidarity that is fleeting. I'm not talking about solidarity that just comes out every town hall meeting. But I'm talking about a solidarity that builds institutions where we can sustain ourselves. A solidarity that sustains the institutions that we already have. Institutions like the Peace Park, institutions like Cheney University should be. Institutions like Temple University used to be. Mm -hmm. My mentor, Dr. Montero, who we all know and love. <laughs> he always says in classes and also in his speeches that white supremacy always finds a way to reproduce itself. And we have to be one step ahead of white supremacy. And that's all gentrification is. We have to become, we have to become more committed, as I've said before. We have to become more disciplined, as I've mentioned. But we also have to become more creative. We cannot continue to use the same models that we've used before to fight in this struggle. We have to start thinking outside of the box. And I'll never pretend like I have all of the answers, but the one thing that me and my comrades have is discipline, commitment, and heart. And we are committed to staying the course. And I think that is what we need, particularly in the space of Philadelphia more than anything. We need the committed activists the committed activist elders like Pam, who we already have, who can show us the ways to go, and also committed young people who want to take this movement further. So, Ashe. Thank you so much, uh, Megan. I want to call to the podium, Ricky. Uh, good morning. Um, I am the academic in the group. <laughs> um, not the organizer, as Patrice is. Uh, not the activist. Uh, not the artist, but striving to be all of those. Um, I want to begin by first of all thanking everyone for being here and extending a special thank you to Patrice, who did indeed take my class last term. Um, she said she learned a lot from me. I think I learned more from her. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and I hope I have something to say that you can take away with you. As an academic, I differ from the previous two in a couple of ways. First of all, I have a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> it's what we do. <laughs> no. 
Um, second of all, I have notes, <laughs> but I'm not going to read my notes, okay? Um, so, I, as I thought about what Patrice and the conference organizers asked me to do, I looked several times at the prompt, because that's what <coughs> academics do. And um, the meaning I made of the prompt was that perhaps what Patrice and the conference wanted was a discussion around where academics and activists could meet. And I think neoliberalism, I think gentrification, and the new urban strategies is that arena where activists and academics can meet, where we can really come together, get our heads around something, and begin to move forward. Um, first of all, the question is, why are we even talking about this? And I think we're talking about this because back in the 1980s, many of you might not have even been born as I look out in the audience. <laughs> But some of us were. And back in, <laughs> and back in the 1980s, um, Margaret Thatcher notoriously made a comment. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. I'm here. I'm here. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, and what Ma Margaret Thatcher notoriously said was, there is no alternative. Right. There is no other way. We must do it this way. And what she did was usher in an era, an era of neoliberalism. Um, what I'd like to do today is to talk about that concept. I'd like for us to, at a minimum, leave all on the same page that we're all talking about the same thing. Because I value precision, and I think that it's when we're not precise that we get all wobbly. And so what I'd like to do is to really firm up and present you with a set of ideas about what neoliberalism really is. Because we all think we know, perhaps, but we might all be on different pages. Um, first of all, it's, it's neo. It's new. So that means that that was something that preceded it. What preceded it then was liberalism. What is liberalism? As we learned in Political Science 101, liberalism is very simply freedom from and freedom to. We are free to do as we choose. We are free from excessive government control. It is a very, very provocative and sexy concept. Neoliberalism, <coughs> prefaced by neo, is a new kind of liberalism that is even sexier. And it's even more provocative. And um, um, so um, <laughs> okay. Um, so so what are we talking about then when we talk about neoliberalism? Again, my goal is for all of us to leave on the same page. Um, I came up with m maybe four or five bullet points, because that's what academics do. Um, neoliberalism is a system that structures life in such a way that past and present oppressions are not addressed. In fact, they don't even exist. 
in this neoliberal era that we are living in, there is no past oppression. We are all on the same page. There is no present oppression. In this context of neoliberalism, there's a particular rhetoric and I'm very interested in discourse and rhetoric because I don't believe that there's anything, any word we speak that does not carry meaning. Even if you say it is raining, it carries some meaning. So this era that we live in is accompanied by a particular rhetoric and it's this idea that we can be free, that we are free, that we can do what we want that we can realize all of the things that we have in our imaginary. It is a rhetoric that embraces difference without a redistribution of resources to address that difference. So in this neoliberal era, we appreciate difference, but what does it really mean? In this neoliberal era, I like to call it a, a happy face, have a nice day. There's a denial of power. We are encouraged to think that none of us has more power. We are encouraged to think that all of us and therefore none of us are responsible. We are encouraged to think that no one is being exploited, when in fact I would argue that all of us are being exploited, white and black, male and female, brown and yellow. It is a rhetoric that is mum about decades of disinvestment. We will come in, we will invest, never mind that for 30 years community people have been asking for better roads asking for better lighting, asking for better whatever. Never mind, we're gonna now come in and we're gonna do it in this neoliberal era. I would argue that this era we live in um, focuses on a particular kind of human nature. It's a human nature that's rational. which I find weird, but, <laughs> and, and I find it weird because you can be rational in any number of ways. You can be economically rational, in which case you want to, you know, maximize profits and all of that, or you can be rational in the sense that you want to be a satisfi satisficer and you just want to be happy, but there's only one kind of rationality that is valued in this neoliberal era that we live in, and that's an economic rationality. So all of our behaviors and all of our actions are evaluated based upon how rational we are. It's a particular kind of human nature that focuses on personal decisions. You do what is best, for you. There's no expectation that you are a part of a bigger group. There's no expectation that you um, belong to something. You do what is best for you. <laughs> it's an icon that was born in the 1980s. Happy face neoliberalism. We are all happy because we are living at a time when we can realize our wildest dreams and imaginations. <laughs> and, and Walmart, yeah. <laughs> um, I would like to suggest to you that this emperor has no clothes. That we are living at the same, under the same things that we have always lived under. And it is a delusion, or rather it is a, an illusion. Um, the narrative of neoliberalism celebrates diversity. 
But it's a very fascinating narrative in that it juxtaposes the desire for diversity, which is fine, with all of those other fears that we have been subjected to. So in gentrified communities, there is a desire to live in a diverse area. But at the same time, there's a fear of crime. There's a dislike for, for other things. So these competing narratives are juxtaposed. And a big question is, is how you resolve those contradictions. Um, what is gentrification in this context? Um, when I first came to Temple 20 some odd years ago, I used to walk from the train station. I used to walk from the train station. And as I would pass by the buildings, I was struck by some graffiti. I will never forget it. The graffiti, someone had written, first we had the land, and they had the Bible. Yeah, now, we have the Bible. now we have the Bible, and they have the land. That's right. And that's OK for us to have the Bible, OK? What's important is that they have the land. And every day, I would pass by that mark on the walls. And every day, it became, it resonated more and more. And over the 20 some years that I have been here at Temple, first of all, one of the things I've seen is that the mural arts program, which we all know and love, uh, painted over it and put a new mural up. And the new mural is an homage to great black leaders. And that's fine, too. This one is no longer there. And I think this had a, a quality to it. It captured something. So the first thing I've seen is that, that these markings are no longer there. The second thing I've seen is that increasingly, there is class and race remake in the community. Um, you can look at advertisement, real, real estate advertisements for homes in the area around Temple. And if you look at those advertisements, you would never know that there is a sizable African-American community and that there was an even larger African-American community. There's a particular way that that space is being presented to others, and it's an invitation. It says, as how can I do this? I'll need your help, maybe. As this video demonstrates, uh, it speaks to what can happen. I got it. I got it. I'm on it. I'm on it. Oh, lights and mic. Okay. Um. Um, this is a, a, a video of a gentrifier, and can we start this over? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, this, is, this is a video of a gentrifier um, in, in Brooklyn. Um, the incident is uh, her walking along the street eating pizza. Someone in a car drives by, hit and run, kills somebody, she sees it, 
Exit full screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, so it's it's the worst fear of what can happen when gentrification occurs. It's the worst fear of what can happen when you get a community with the ethos is primarily that of the individual. It's the worst fear of what can happen um, when neoliberalism meets gentrification. Most of the advertisements it's up to you to find what suits you best. Your particular style will not only be matched but enhanced when you come to places like Brewery Town, places like Fort Greene, increasingly places like North Philadelphia. So, I would argue that space is not empty, it's not abstract, it's not just a theoretical concept, it is the product of desire, mm. and that desire is capital, that desire is individualism, that desire is all of those things that we were familiar with before they called it neoliberalism, when it was the old liberal, just liberalism. And so, I think this whole process leads us to some questions, and there are two kinds of questions. There are three kinds of questions. There are questions that should be directed at activists. There are questions that should be directed at those who are orchestrating the process. And there are questions that should be directed at academics. And so, for the activist, I think a critical question is, what are we, or what are you insulted by? Are you insulted by the ideology? Or are you insulted by the individuals? I think a question to direct to those who are orchestrating the process is, can you think outside the box? Do you need to think outside the box? Maybe you need to think inside the box. Maybe you need to look at the structures that exist and find a way to manipulate those structures that exist to bring about effective change. I think a question for academics is when you bring people together who occupy diverse demographics, Can you expect mere contact, passing by each other in the morning? Have a nice day. Thank you. Can you expect that to shift attitudes that have been produced over years? So as an academic, I would like to leave you with those questions. and. Um, hope that at least we're closer to being on the same page about neoliberalism.
Thank you, Ricky. So y'all see why I took her class, right? <laughs> she the bomb. <laughs> so we're going to open it up to Q&A, to the audience. And actually, yes, I'm going to come up here. Um, we want questions only. Uh, no comments, only because of due to time. We just want questions because we want some real engagement. So we want questions, please. Yes, yeah, so I see the sister with the blue sweater. Hello. Um, I just have a question in, in, about neoliberal, neoliberalism for everyone or anyone who's willing to answer. Can anyone talk about the intersections as simply as possible between neoliberalism, democracy, and capitalism. Ricky? No <laughs> Patrice, I'm going to have a few folks ask questions, then we'll toss okay. it back to the panel. Okay. Just want to pick on this. House. You can just point out those. Um, we're going to start on this side. Okay. So. Right here with the sweater, Christmas looking. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. It's a I'm not going to say, I just want to say, I don't want to say he or she because I, you know, right, right. I got you. I got you. I got you. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of call you out by what you have on, okay? I, you know, so. Dr. Sanders, your last slide showed, uh, said that you were looking, you, you said that we should be directing questions towards those orchestrating the process. Yeah. And I'd like to hear from each of the panelists who those people are regarding the process of gentrification. Hi, um, I'm interested in finding out who in the Philadelphia and New Jersey area who are legal um, civil rights and housing um, lawyers that go after the foreclosure and the banking industry because I think that needs to be a, a strategic economic piece that they deliberately tried to foreclose on people uh, over the last six seven years and 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 as in part of the banking industry is JP Morgan Chase Bank Wells Fargo all of these banks that everyone utilize maybe we need to sit down and, and what is the legal strategy to reclaiming some of the houses, land, and property for people of color? And what is the legal strategy for reparations? With the blue shirt. Uh, thanks. Uh, I just had a question, uh, kind of in the same vein as a person that spoke before me. Could you me. speak up, please? Sure. I'm sorry. I just had a question in the same vein uh, as a person that spoke before me. Because um, it seems like it's really hard to fight gentrification once it's already happened. And I wanted to hear some of you all maybe speak more about how to, especially in black communities, how we can prevent gentrification economically and, you know, also legally. But I was thinking more so economically of like, you know, gaining more economic control over black property. With the... Let's start over here and then work. I think after this last question, let's get some answers. So the, with the white and green shirt. Um, I always find situations like this, you know, very empowering and grateful to be in the presence of everybody. But my question is, how is it, even to the panel, hopefully you can form, you know, some sort of answer for this. How is it that you take energy and information like this and to be dispersed amongst the masses so that way you have the actual numbers to be, find a particular buy-in and to find a worth in being able to fight against gentrification or to even have simple needs of something as simple as food deserts to stop existing in various neighborhoods. Because whatever we do in here means nothing and it doesn't matter if we can't take it outside. I heard you, sister, when you said that there's not enough bodies. So basically, how is it that you have someone who doesn't see any value in their community to find a value in something so that way we're not just a small minority in doing any of this at all. So, I mean, that's a question to not only the panel, but to everybody in here, because everybody's charged, because you chose to be here. Thank you. 
All ready to answer? Well, I can address the last question. One thing that happened in here, here in Philadelphia, once again, they still appropriated 55 lots with no plan using federally funded dollars. So my plan is to create the plan for them. The same thing happened in Pittsburgh when they gentrified the Hill District and a visionary out there by the name of <clears throat> Bill Strickland built the Manchester Craftsman Guild. What Philadelphia didn't know is I sat on that panel to make sure he received his first $25,000 grant. What I want to do now is put pressure on the city of Philadelphia to build the Manchester Craftsman Guild here in Philadelphia, starting with the vocational school, the trade school, the life skills resource center, the thousand seated theater, the culinary school, the mixed use senior citizen home with art spaces in each one of those properties. Dupre Studio Museum in Mantua, Art Center, University of Pennsylvania. Working within their construct. They are looking right now at the promise zone money that you ask about the money doesn't exist. It's $2.9 billion worth of economic development coming to the Mantua community. I'd actually like for you to say more about that $2.9 billion coming into Mantua and, and how it could be accessed for community uses, but we can move on. Um, I think all of the questions are, are really good questions. I'm going to address those that I can address. You know, um, con concept one. Um, the first one, if I understood correctly, was to speak to the difference between neoliberalism and capitalism and democracy. Um, I don't think that there's a big difference in neoliberalism and capitalism. I think it's been shrouded, it's been dressed up differently. I think what guides the neoliberal process is capitalism. Um, and, and so that's why I asked the question whether or not the emperor is really wearing clothes, because I, I don't know. I think if we look very closely at the neoliberal process, we would see that the aims are those of capital. And so I would argue that they are the same. In, in terms of democracy, um, I think it is a good idea. <laughs> I'm of that generation, you know. <laughs> um, I do think it is, it, it is a good idea. It is, it, it's something to aim toward. We weren't at the table. Again, I value precision. Many of us weren't at the table when that idea was being shaped. And so I think it is incumbent upon us to shape it, to be what we want it to be. Um, I, I think, though, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a, a worthwhile concept. I, I would fear that if we threw it out, we would, be, we would not be able to replace it. We would not be able to replace it, okay? So for me, it's to come to the table and shape it. Uh, the other question that I, no, no, no. 
Um, I wanted to just respond to the question about who's orchestrating the process of gentrification. Um, I don't think that that is something that's really hidden. I think that if we look to our city government, we have Michael Nutter who basically opened up the entire city <laughs> to um, gentrifiers. And also, of course, when we talk about policing, you had Charles Ramsey who just was run out of town. Um, <laughs> He also played a part in, of course, keeping gentrification going. But I think that if we want to get deeper into that discussion, I think we have to also look at the white liberal communities that keep it going, as well as the black gatekeeper class that constantly play a role in this process of gentrification. But because they're black, you know, other black people don't really want to say anything to them. And I think I heard Glenn Ford talk about, you know, the issue of black gatekeepers and black people who are, you know, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Thank you, the black leadership class who are, you know, part and parcel of this whole issue of neoliberalism, capitalism, and the illusion of democracy, but no one is calling them out. And so I think until we as a community of radicals are willing to organize in that regard, we're gonna to continue to see the issues with gentrification police brutality and everything else that we're going to be talking about here this weekend. Uh, if I can, if I can and jump in and piggyback, um, I really think it is important for us to ask ourselves, what are we insulted by, the ideology or the individuals? Okay. Or both. Mm -hmm. Patrice, someone takes some questions from the middle here. Yeah, um, but just I want to add piggyback really quick because this is important. We need to understand that our public housing play a huge role in the process of gentrification and the changing of uh, our communities. Um, we have to know that the housing and urban development, which is a government federally funded agency that controls public housing in our cities throughout the country, that they play a major role because they're not in the business of building affordable housing anymore. It's not, how, public housing is, is done, is done with, is all about mixed income housing, so they play a major role. And uh, Mr. Dupre, um, I don't know if he mentioned this, but uh, Obama played a major role in what's going on in Mantua. He initiated the Promise Zone, which came out of uh, Choice Neighborhoods in Hope Six, which tore down Richard Allen projects and all the housing uh, uh, high rises throughout the country. So that's important to know that it's not, you know, just, just one single person. You know, it's, you know, structural. it's structural, right, <laughs> right. So, and, and I'll say, we, so we're going to focus on this area and then we're going to move over here, if that's okay. So um, I want to just also address the question that the brother had in the back about, you know, how do we get masses of people to buy in to, I guess, the revolution? And um, <laughs> sorry. I don't, unfortunately, have an answer. I think just like every other activist, I'm going through the motions and searching for the answers and trying new things. But I definitely think some of the things that have worked for my comrades and I have been being in the streets being that example, you know, willing to pull people in with us. But I think that as we go on, I think we need to really um, set up structures that promote the idea of political education. I teach eighth grade, and that's something that is sorely missing, not just from my eighth graders, but also from the parents, also from the grandparents, just the community in general. And so I think that we need to create spaces where we can have these discussions, but not just talk about it, but also create you know, opportunities for people to act as well. And I think we also need to become more involved in survival programs. I think that one of the things that turn people off about the idea of revolution is that it's constantly people talking about what things are gonna happen in the future. But we have people who are living in conditions where they feel like they are trapped and they can't move. And so we have to be able to provide for some of their immediate concerns, their immediate issues in terms of food, water, and shelter. And you know that's something that we really aren't doing so great of a job of as activists, I think. And this is not just Philly, but um, nationally. All right, we're gonna start from the, 
Can we start from the front and move our way back, if that's okay? So let's get the brother in the yellow, I'm sorry, the, in the yellow, and then we're going to move over to the side. What's that? Yeah, real quickly, Patrice, I, I want to just say this. I want all of y'all to take a look. I'm going to give y'all an address, 1512 through 16 North. Is it North a question? Street. Yeah, I just, we, I just want to. We got to do a question. Yeah, yeah, but Patrice, I want to let the audience know that what we'll discuss at the panels in dedication to this conference is happening right in the community, right on Broad Street. All five buildings have been wiped out right in the 1500 block of Broad Street. I'm going to say, listen, because we have to be disciplined. That's yeah, one I, thing. I we got to be disciplined. So I said that we're going to have questions. Whatever you say, you have to form it into a question. Patrice, yeah, I understand, Patrice, but let, let me, I, I'm from the community. I just want to let them know that what we discuss up here on the panel is happening right in the area. Okay, okay so let's go to this side. Let me ask let me. Let's go. Okay, let me ask Okay, let me ask, let me push you. Let me ask a question then. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Let, I, I meant no harm, Patrice, but let me ask a question then. How? Yeah, because I was. I'm from the community. I just want to let them know, so the way they can go by with all their cameras and take a look at what's happening, what they talked about. That's one thing I'll say. Okay. Now I'll ask my question. I'm sorry. I have a question. Let, my question points to. Let me finish. Let me. Can I? Can I ask my question? No, no. Thank all right. you. All right. Can I? Can I? All right. All right. All right. Patrice. Patrice. Let me ask you a question, Patrice. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. But Patrice knows me. Brother. I'm, I'm in, they're asking you to ask a question. Can I? Can I ask my question, brother? Well, can I have the floor? Can Patrice, I have the floor? Can I have the floor? Because I'm going to let you go because I, the energy is going somewhere. Yeah, yeah. It's going somewhere is that, I, that I'm not really feeling. Okay. So I'm going to let you go. You, you can go ahead, brother. Okay, go ahead. I appreciate it, Patrice. You know me, Patrice. That's the only thing I wanted to share is that what they were saying is happening around us. Now I'll ask my question. The Neil, what you, what you discussed, Ricky, and you, you know me as well, all right? And I, James, I know your story, and I've heard your story as well, all right? How can we, that are from these various communities, how can we stop this from happening? And also talking about the policing. I've all, I did a story with Temple, uh, the Temple News concerning policing. So what would be a strategy to combat that as well as the policing that you're talking about? Oof. First of all, you. you have to understand what I said at the beginning. Here in Philadelphia, this plan was devised in 1950. They seized the community by blighting the community. Lowers property values. You can't get a bank loan. There were no new businesses in the last 20 years, only three businesses in the Mantua community. So how do you find it? It's an enormous amount of money in these legal fees. Our people in these communities cannot fight back. Willie Lynch law then, then applies. The community is seized through lies and perpetrated by the gangsters. My life was in danger in my own community. It wasn't until I met five generations of the gang leaders in Mantua. So how do you fight back? I'm the last Mohegan standing. Right. So. Okay, so we want to get, and I'm, let's get all the questions and then we're going to get responses. So can we just stay disciplined, please, and consistent? And respectful, thank you. And if I raise my voice, I apologize. Anybody who knows me knows. No apologies necessary. All right, All right so I have a quick question. Um, since colleges and universities happen to be the agents of gentrification, especially in Philadelphia, how can college-age youth challenge this despite the alluring neoliberal promise of these institutions? Okay, what? Johanna. 
can. Okay, um, I think that we're in the springtime of uh, what, as Professor Montero mentioned, is going to be a great movement in American history that's going to make history. And I, I'm actually going to say that what I think we have to have in this forum is a dialogue, not necessarily a question to, because we are activists and thinkers. And what is going to determine whether we win against the ruling class or lose is whether all of us, whether we all develop as, um, as thinkers and theorists. I'm a professor, but I am an activist. I think of myself as an activist on the street, and I can tell you that I have learned more in the streets than I ever learned at Columbia University, where I got my PhD. On this note, on this note, I just want to say as an historian, because history is important, and Malcolm X has said, our leader, that history of all of the professions will, um, will benefit us the most. It is important to understand, and I'm, I'm adding, Professor, to your definition, that neoliberalism emerges out of a particular historical conjuncture. In the 1970s and 80s, when capitalism was in crisis, because of what people of color were doing abroad in places like Vietnam. So we need to connect what happened in the previous section with what's happening, the conversation that's going on today. Vijay Prashad said that in 1950, the United States produced three-fifths of the world's goods. That changed completely. Capital had to be financialized. The rate of profit of capitalism went down. And what the ruling class did was that it decided that everything we gained in the 1930s and the 1960s had to be taken away. So public housing is going to be demolished. Welfare, demolished. Wages, demo demolished. Healthcare, demolished. What neoliberalism did was that it destroyed the social safety net and this is what is this is how gentrification is connected historically real estate land has been the immediate primary Johanna, way Johanna okay Johanna, I, I'm Johanna. gonna end here the immediate primary way to gain profits and that's what's happening in our communities and there is a way to take it back we need to essentially take back our communities, our buildings. It's going to take a process, but it can happen. Thank you. Erica? Yes. So my question is... Respect, one mic, one mic. So my question is connected to everything that everyone is uh, producing here in this dialogue, and it is how we, the, the people of color primarily in this room, how we can preserve our black spaces. And I know a lot of times we get confused because of ideology, but my thing is if we can all agree that at the end of the day we all want to get free, we can get work done. So right now they're investing... Right now, I want to know how we as a community can preserve our black spaces, our historic black spaces, such as the Lorraine Divine Hotel, which belongs to us. The fact that there is a playground at Fourth and Catherine that is built on the, the uh, tops of bar slave burial grounds. How can we in the community put our dollars together because we can't afford Jordans, who is a, a, a woman abuser. We can't afford like all these different things that really doesn't benefit our communities, but we're not collectively coming together to preserve our historic black space. So I want to know how we as community activists, organizers, and thinkers can reserve our black spaces. One more, and then we're going to get answers. Um, I would like someone to speak on the history. Mona, speak up. I would like someone to speak on the history of gentrification. My question is, how far back can you take it? Because in the United States of America, indigenous people in this country, to me, were the first gentrified. So it has a history, and I would like some of those people. And just in closing, I would like to thank Glenn Ford and Megan for speaking on the issue of how we support black 
politicians, officials, because Wilson Good was the mayor when that bomb was dropped on me and my family. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get answers. So, um, wow. <laughs> These are some awesome questions and I'm gonna try to answer them as best as I can. So, um, I wanna start with the sister. I think that um, she's bringing up a very important problem within the movement. I think she's bringing up something that people don't like to talk about. And I feel like we still haven't really addressed the issue of patriarchy and sexism and just simply accepting the leadership of women without exception. Um, I see some mad faces, but um, oh well. <laughs> Um, I feel like in black spaces, we continually try to sweep the fact that we have problems with misogyny under the rug. Even some of our gay brothers deal in misogyny and that does not come out. And I feel like even some of our sisters deal in misogyny too. They're either complicit in it out of ignorance or because, you know, frankly, they're trying to hold on to a man. And, um, Um, and that's the situation, and I think that if we're going to, I think that if we're really going to extend this movement where it needs to be, women have to be full leaders, full participants, and we have to think of ourselves as revolutionaries. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I'm not fighting in this revolution to get half free. I'm fighting this, in this revolution to get free completely. And anyone who tries to stop me, I don't care who it is, they're going to have a problem. Um, so to the brother, you had a question about how to combat strategy, I'm sorry, how to create strategies to combat policing. And I think the first thing that we need to do when we leave here is try to convince the majority of black people that police are bad. I feel like... Um, there's been heavy organization in Philadelphia over the last two and a half years, and we're still having conversation about good cops. And so to me, you know, the fact that most of our people don't understand that there can't be good cops in a racist system, and there can't be good cops in a system that was created out of, you know, slave patrols and patty rollers, I feel like that's one thing that we can do when we leave here, and that goes to the political education piece. And I think there was also a question by um, Jerome, right, in the front, you were talking about, you know, how students, I guess, can I get, fight against the neoliberalism of universities. And I think that we've already had a good example of that with the um, young people at the University of Missouri. But my only critique of that is that they didn't go far enough. And I feel like they, um, you know, won a, a victory. It was a great victory, but I am concerned that they're not going to push the narrative about racism, white supremacy, and you know imperialism on university campuses any further. And so I think this goes to Patrice's point that she's been mentioning over and over again, the idea of commitment and discipline and staying the course, because I think a lot of people think that the revolution is gonna be like this short battle and we're gonna win and we're all gonna get free. But I think that this is a long civil rights movement that will probably not end in my lifetime or my kid's lifetime, but we're gonna be constantly chipping away at it. And I feel like that um, is what we need to do. I hope I answered your question. So we're, we're over time. I'm sorry we're not able to get any more questions. I uh, also want to add, we're going, it's a lunch break. I believe it's going to be until 1.45 is when the next panel starts. But I just want to quickly thank my panelists, James, Ricky. Please give it up. Yeah. Megan. Yes. I'm sorry we were short on time. I wanted to give them to have them do closing remarks and also talk about what they're working on. But, you know, Google them or Facebook them. 
however you want to do it. But thank you so, so, so much. Thank you.